Hi folks, welcome to the Cool Season Flower Chronicles. My name is Lisa Mason Ziegler and I'm the author of the book, Cool Flowers, which this whole five week series is based upon. I'm glad you've decided to join me here. And for those who we may not have met, let me just tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from so you'll know how to apply it for you, I have been a commercial cut flower farmer since 1998, and I am an urban farmer. My farm is literally located dead in the middle of the city. I have less than three acres. I am in, when I started farming, I was in 7B, but now we've creeped into 8A, and I have no houses. I have no hoop houses. I do use some very lightweight low tunnels that we build out of lightweight row cover, but we have no outdoor structures. So I think that really helps people to understand that what I'm sharing with you, anybody can really apply, whether you're a home gardener or a flower farmer. Um, we really do it without any outdoor structures. So this is week two. This week we are talking about when do you plant? cool flowers. And um, I want to say that, first off, if you don't already have a book, the book Cool Flowers, which is all about this amazing group of flowers known as hardy annuals, which are some of the most beloved spring bloomers that, frankly, most of us miss out on. And it's because of their awkward and we feel like they're finicky, but y'all, they are not finicky at all when you plant them at the right time, right? So, if you don't already have the book, Cool Flowers, there'll be a link down below where you can purchase it from me. I would love to personally autograph a book for you. And when you purchase it directly from us at thegardenersworkshop.com, um, you will automatically get the link to my free companion video book study. So, that'll automatically come to you. And that is a video each for each chapter of me kind of connecting the dots and kind of sharing the behind the scenes information on that. Now this series, The Cool Season Flower Chronicles, is brought to you by thegardenersworkshop.com where, you know, our whole goal is making it so for flower lovers at every level to grow and enjoy flowers and even for people to build businesses based on flowers, y'all. So I want to just hop right in. I do have some notes, a little bit of notes this week because um, I'm going to do a little bit of chatting. I've had there um, have been questions posted everywhere, and so I am going to address some of those. So let's just get right into it, right? So this week, we're going to learn when you plant cool flowers. And I just have to stop here, and if I had a hat, I'd tip it to you. Kudos to all of you that did your homework. I have been seeing all over the internet people talking about doing their homework and figuring out what their winter hardiness zones are, what their frost dates are, and I'm telling y'all, that is the secret ingredient that opens the door to everything. So, I wish there I could hand you a, a something, um, but I just thank you so much for doing that. So, y'all... This is the rub, the equation, the rest of the story, the bottom line, and you need to write this down. And I'm going to say it a couple, three times probably. And I'm going to read it off of my paper. Because this is the basic premise behind cool flowers. And y'all remember, I did not make this up. I didn't discover this. Um, this has been done for centuries before, or decades, not centuries, decades before us. And so we are just refiguring out how to figure out for each one of our own individual environments on how to do this. So the first thing I want to talk about is your winter hardiness zone. What your winter hardiness zone tells you is what you can plant in fall. I'm going to say that again. Your winter hardiness zone tells you what you can plant in fall. And I'm going to tell you more about that 
but I'm gonna say it one more time because you need to write this down. That's pretty much all your winter hardiness zone is good for. It's gonna tell you what you can fall plant. Because next, when you have your list of cool flowers, and if for anybody that has their book, if you look on page 138, and I have it marked in the book here, this is the cheat sheet, and this lists 30 cool flowers, and it lists all of the winter hardiness zones that we know of, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a second. So this means that you can know in your winter hardiness zone, you can look at this list, and any flower that is hardy in your zone, you should be fall planting. And yes, we can plant again in very early spring and we're getting to that. But that's all we're focusing on right now is figuring out what you could fall plant. So, wait a minute, I got away from my notes already. So when you add in to your winter hardiness zone what the plant's winter hardiness is, that starts your list. So I want you to make two lists. You're gonna make a list of the things that are eligible for you to fall plant, and then everything else you can plant, and I want everyone to get in the habit of calling it this, very early spring. Because if you just say spring to somebody, they're thinking, you know, cool nights and warm days. That is not when we're talking about the second planting window for cool flowers. Very early spring for us here, oftentimes we even have snow on the ground. So you're gonna make a list and you're gonna have everything that you can plant in very early in fall. And I will say this, that if you do have a hoop house, that buys you one zone. So let's say you're in zone six. If you have a hoop house, that means that zone seven stuff can surely be planted into that hoop house. So that's gonna start your list of what things you can plant fall versus very early spring, okay? Now let's talk about your frost date for just a minute. Well, for maybe for a couple of minutes, actually. Your frost date is what tells you when you can actually, that window of opportunity that you should be shooting for to plant. So I've heard, I've been reading a lot of um, tr people having trouble of finding their frost dates. And I would say, I mean, there are surely some people, there's people that live in places that have no frost dates. And I, I've got some of that stuff in my questions. I call them the hiccups. We're going to address some of the hiccup issues. But I want to just say, repeat from last week you need to go to reliable sources. We're talking about a historical expected frost dates. That means not just the last two or three years. I'm talking about getting connecting with your extension office or going online and finding a reliable website that you can um, look that up because this is based on several years historic information. And yes, I know about climate change better than anybody. I mean, I'm living it. But you have to have a jumping off point. Um, you can't get caught up. And I've already read about some people getting very caught up in worrying about this. Y'all just get the information. We're going to pick a variable date. And if you have two or three conflicting pieces of information, we're going to find the medium and that's where you're going to jump off because I'm gonna tell you the greatest fail of cool flowers, that's not planting them at all. <laughs> and there are so many people that do that because they just are so afraid of doing it wrong. And y'all, it is okay. I planted wrong for a long time. Do you have any mistakes I made to get, to be able to plant all the stuff that I plant now? So, your frost date tells you when that planting window is. It's not telling you what you can fall or winter or very early spring plant, right? So your winter hardiness zone tells you what you can plant in fall. We can all plant in very early spring. Some of us at a little bit different timing based on your conditions, but everybody can plant in that second window typically, but there's some hiccups there too, y'all. You just live and learn based on experiences. 
your frost dates are gonna actually help you drill down to when that actual date is. So, let's talk about those planting times. So, for me, on this list, um, I'm just gonna stop and just say this about the zones that are listed in Cool Flowers. So, on that page 138, and this is the cover of the book for anybody that hasn't seen that. Um, on page 138, which is this cheat sheet, you'll see that there's probably, there's a lot of sevens in here, Winter Hardy Nose Zone 7 which is basically what I was when this book was written. Um, and I've squeaked over to eight now. But many of these flowers, we could not find any other documentation to be able to know if they were winter hardy to a colder zone than me. But I will tell you that since Cool Flowers has been printed in 2014, there are so much experimenting and successes. Um, and I will mention, I mean, for instance, Buplurum and Bells of Ireland, both of them I know are at least one more zone colder, winter hardy in a colder zone than what's listed in Cool Flowers. So this is, in, this is a really good jumping off point, but if you live, um, if you're like me where you're living on the edge of a zone, for sure go for the colder zone. No question about that. All right, so what is the planting window, right? So if we're just gonna work from my, my first expected historic frost date is mid-November. So that's November 15th. So the window of opportunity, the best window of opportunity to plant is six to eight weeks before that date. And why is it six to eight weeks? Because there's two ways that we plant plants, right? We direct seed plants and we plant by transplant. And we're gonna talk about that in on week four. By planting either one of those at that time, the six to eight weeks before your first expected frost date, that allows Let's take the seeds first, those things that love to be direct seeded. Let's just use larkspur is an excellent example of that. By planting that seed in the garden six to eight weeks before your first hard frost, assuming that larkspur is winter hardy in your zone, that gives it six to eight weeks to sprout and to form into a little baby plant. And that little baby plant was what's gonna go through winter. The second choice would be, or the second thing to look at is a transplant. So snapdragons or sweet william, both of those are classic transplants that are planted. We obviously have to start them several weeks before that planting window, right? Because if I'm supposed to have a transplant ready to go into the ground six to eight weeks before my first expected frost date, then I have to start it before then, and I'll address that in just a moment. By planting that transplant six to eight weeks before my expected frost date, that allows the transplant the opportunity to become established before it goes into winter. So, the six to eight weeks before your first frost date is the window of opportunity to plant seeds, and transplants. That's a very common question that we get. Well, is that for both? It is for both because both of them need time to become established before winter sets in. That's the whole point of that six to eight weeks. However, I will tell you, um, I'm just going to add a lot of personal experience tidbits here. Um, Direct seeding, and we, I do not direct seed anything in spring or summer, um, meaning warm season tender annuals. I only direct seed cool flowers. And so I direct seed several, five or six or seven, I forget how many different flowers, maybe actually more than that now, different flowers. And my window of opportunity to direct seed or to plant for fall is mid-September, to October. Now, 
I've experienced many falls now, 22 of them actually, planting cool flowers. And I have experienced in the last five years that fall is kind of going on a little longer than it ever used to. So what's special about cool flowers? They're cool season hardy annuals. That means they like it cool. So I now, as a general rule, plant a little later instead of a little earlier. You know, you have that six to eight week window. I always go to six weeks now and even push it a little bit more, which I'll explain. When you're direct seeding out in the garden, you can't push the envelope but so far because the seeds need some heat to break dormancy and to sprout. Meaning, if you try to direct seed in the middle of the winter, yes, that seed, if somebody doesn't eat it, will sit there all winter and wait for warm conditions um, in very early spring to sprout, but that defeats the whole purpose of planting in the fall. The poor purpose of planting in the fall is for the plants to become so well established during winter that they start earlier, they're better established, they're more abundant, more disease and pest resistant, and they're just better plants, right? So you wanna direct seed kinda on time. You wanna plant them in time enough that they have, their, have the conditions that they need to sprout to form into a little baby plant before winter sets in. With transplants, you definitely have more wiggle room because you don't have to have that heat um, to because you're starting them all inside. You're going to walk out with a transplant and plant it. And I will tell you, that's been the conversation over in our um, flower farming school, my online course for flower farming school. We have a closed Facebook group um, and there's been some conversations going on. And the topic has been that so many people, eager beavers, I was there, I've done it start too early, they're planting too early, that I air even a little bit beyond that six weeks before my frost date to plant my transplants. Because what you don't want to have happen by planting too early, then having the fall go on longer, and this may not be such a issue for those of you that live in really cold, you know, zone three, zone four, and zone five, but those of us that live in zone seven and eight and nine in the lower half of the United States, we have watched our cool flower transplants either cook alive, if you use bio, we use biodegradable film, black film, um, and we use the black because that helps the transplants grow during the winter from the sun, keeping the roots warmer, right? We've watched our transplants cook alive because fall just was way hotter than it was supposed to be. Or, worse yet, it's just warm until way past your first expected frost, and the plants grow way too big. Uh, we had Ami Magus. I, I think of that because Ami Magus is a flower that we never have enough of, and it's a very important crop to us. Um, Ami Magus, I think two or three winters ago, was hip high going into winter. Of course, it all got winter killed because it was too big. So that's what you're trying to avoid. So the moral to the story is direct seed, particularly kind of close to what your window of opportunity is, so you allow enough time for seeds to germinate, sprout into a baby plant before they head into winter. You have a little bit more wiggle room when you um, are planting transplants, and we're going to talk in week four about which way of those you're going to go and all the details about doing that. So, I already shared that my zone has changed. Um, you just have to do the best you can, y'all. And this also, you know, I'm not a really great record keeper. I mean, that's just well, not one of my strong suits. So, you know, if you are a great record keeper, um, one of the things that I share, I think, in all both of my books and really hit home in flower farming school is all about the big calendar. Um, the big calendar is the brains, the lifeline, the cash flow of this farm because it tells us when to do everything. If you were to write down what your highs and lows were, that's where I would write that. But you have to, I mean, there's just enough reliable resources that you really should not have to do that. So here again, I'm going to repeat it before we move on. 
Your winter hardiness zone tells you what you can plant in fall. If it's winter hardy in your zone, for sure fall plant it. And on page 138 of Cool Flowers is a one sheet transplant um, winter hardiness guide that will tell you what the plant is hardy to, and if it's hardy in your zone, you plant it. So I'm just gonna kinda hit on a couple of these hiccups that people um, have expressed trouble with. For one thing is I've had a lot of questions about people wanting, asking about succession planting with cool flowers. Succession planting with cool flowers is very different than the warm season tender annuals. Um, so the two windows of, it really depends on where you are. If you're in zone eight and nine, um, you can maybe even do some succession planting through the winter because you're not that cold. And you know, our ground doesn't even freeze here. So we can plant through the winter. The problem, the question is, is it actually beneficial to do that? And I have found for us, it is not. That we fall plant and then we very early spring plant. And the very early spring planting is um, not everything. So let's talk about very early spring. I almost forgot that, y'all. Very early spring planting, and that's how you should refer to it, is six to eight weeks before your last expected spring frost. So for me, my last expected historical frost is mid-April. So for us every year, Valentine's Day is like our eight weeks from that last day. So that is when we would plant anything we're going to plant again from fall. And I'll just stop right here. And I've done um, a, little, a lot of that. I mean, back, especially in high production, we planted everything that we could in fall. And then we planted again in very early spring. And in addition, in very early spring, you plant everything that you couldn't plant in the fall because it's not winter hardy for you. Those plants will still can take cold. They just can't take the deep, brutal, long cold of going through winter. So we can all plant up to six to eight weeks before your last spring frost, okay? So for us, that's like Valentine's Day. But here is the, the real point with this, and we're gonna talk deeper about this next week when we're talking about preparing and making your garden a little bit more hospitable to cool flowers. Your six to eight weeks window before your last spring frost is you have to prepare that planting area in the fall. I don't care when you plant. People in Alberta, zone three, people in zone eight and nine, if you are planning on planting anything in the very early spring, which for us, we typically have snow on the ground a lot of times, but if there's not snow, it is wet and it's, you cannot work the soil. So regardless of whether you're gonna plant in the fall, if you're gonna plant anything in the very early spring, you need to prepare it. So, um, and I will, I wanna just say this because I did get a lot of comments from folks that really live in part in zones five, four, and three. Um, we have, and if y'all are on here, please chime in and help support these other cold weather gardeners. Um, we have a lot of people experiencing cool flowers in very cold zones. Um, at first, once first of all, people thought they were all for fall planting, and that's not true. Because here's the window of opportunity for those of you that live in cold zones, zones that have snow up to the very last minute or ice. Um, you are going to be able to plant cool flowers out in the field or in your garden weeks and weeks before you can plant a warm season tender annual. That is your big benefit. Um, if you can't fall plant, because I know there are people in zone three on here, um, and the problem with fall planting in those regions is not only is it bitter cold for such a long period of time, there's often super deep snow load, and that makes it even more difficult. So I would suggest to you, certainly experiment, but I would suggest to you 
to embrace that this group of flowers are the flowers that you can put into the ground weeks before you can put a warm season annual in the ground. But the secret is you're gonna to have to prepare that spot in fall because you will never be able to get, because that's the number one thing I hear from people. There's just no way I could plant that time of the year. You know, there's snow on the ground or it's just so wet. Well, not if you follow this fall prepare, then cover the bed somehow. That's one of the things I talk about in that online course. Um, and to make a way for you to be able to access that bed as early as possible. And we're gonna talk about on the preparation week um, about things you can do to help tweak like low tunnels and those types of things. One of the questions that I got um, was about succession planting, particularly in the deep south. And I will tell you that I've only, I won't say only, I typically plant for the very early spring planting only those things that I can't fall plant. For me, that's straw flowers. They just do not overwinter here, so we don't fall plant them just in very early spring. I also very early spring plant um, stock, but I do plant Sweet William again and Bupleurum. All the rest of them, I have found that they either bloom at the same time as their counterpart that was fall planted, um, and they aren't as tall and they aren't as abundant, or there's just no real benefit. You know, they fall victim to disease. Um, so don't struggle so much if you are in zone eight and nine. I would totally focus on your fall planting um, and only think very early spring for those things you can't fall plant because you get so warm and hot so quickly. Um, then somebody asked about um, starting seeds before, how long in advance before to have a transplant at the proper time? And that is really a very difficult answer, question to answer because we all use different methods of seed starting. Seed starting is totally dependent on environmental, meaning the conditions you're growing them in, what your temperatures are, your lights, what method, are you soil blocking, are you plug traying it? Um, so, but you have to figure out how long it takes you typically to start a transplant. And I will say that I like to have a little bigger transplant for fall planting than I do any other time of the year because they're not going to do a lot of top growth. Their roots are what's going to grow over winter. Um, so hopefully that helps you. Then somebody asked, when can they think about this being, um, blooming? Um, blooming typically happens two to three weeks earlier than it normally would for you if you'd have spring planted. So, um, and I just really want to emphasize using the proper verbiage of very early spring planting, because when you say spring planting, that does not really say what we're doing. And that's part of the education of helping all of us and everybody um, is it really helps. And I also wanna just plant the seed that get your seeds. We're already falling into that window where we'll begin to run out of stuff um, as everybody is ordering. So you can visit the gardenersworkshop.com. And now I want to just tell you, I'm picking my little group of flowers. Each week I'm telling you about why I love a certain group. And this week I'm talking about a group that I really, really love, Rudbeckias. And I even have some this week, y'all. Um, Rudbeckias are a really important group of flowers um, as a flower farmer, as a flower gardener, and as a pollinator native plant, um, native bee person. And Rudbeckias are amazing. Um, I have five that I grow typically, and all five of the links will show up in this feed here. Um, and I wanna share with you first, I always say, you know, the one I have in my hand is my favorite, but this really is my favorite. Don't tell the rest of them. But this is Rudbeckia triloba. And this is the best little filler. Let me find the best way to show you this. This is the best little filler flower. Anybody that makes bouquets loves this stuff, y'all. This is probably why my nose is itching. Um, and this is actually, these flowers are from last Monday. I cut these before the storm. And I mean, look at this. I'm trying to get the head so you can 
Can you imagine having this in a bouquet? Um, so, Rudbeckia triloba, which um, all the seed links will be down below, is a late bloom in Rudbeckia. And I will tell you that there's a lot of Rudbeckias out there. And um, there are others that bloom later in the season. They all have to be fall or very, very early spring planted because the, most of them are day length sensitive. They don't bloom in the late into the fall. Um, but this is a priceless. Um, and I did a um, Instagram, Insta TV walk on my triloba patch. You need to go over and check that out. You can go to our um, Gardener's Workshop farm over there and check that out. Um, so that's really important. My other favorites, probably my two most go-to for bouquet making and our commercial customer favorites are Prairie Sun and Goldilocks. Goldilocks is a double and it's a little smaller. Um, we also grow Indian Summer, which is the really big one, but I find that sometimes it's just too darn big, y'all. It's like big sunflowers. Some, they aren't all usable, and they're sometimes hard to um, hydrate because of that, but I find that Prairie Sun, which is the green-eyed one, is smaller, and our customers love them, our bouquet makers love them, um, and they're just so very, very useful. The double daisy, the, I think it's actually the double gloriosa daisy, is another really beautiful one, but we have a strong tarnish bug issue on our farm, and the double daisy really um, reeks of their damage. So we still grow it, and we get some, but we get a lot of damaged ones. So our go-to are actually... Prairie Sun and Goldilocks. But here it is, y'all. More importantly, that is such an important group of flowers to native bees. So we have a huge native bee colonies here on our farm. Those are bees that don't live in boxes, y'all. They live in the ground. And so this group of flowers not only is a huge cash crop, a beautifier in your garden, they will reseed. We have reseeding um, beneficial creature islands here on my farm that are based in this group um, and you can manage that. I actually have a in Cool Flowers a little um, self-sowed ways to, to cultivate and make the most of that instead of being annoyed with it and um, I just can't tell you enough about these guys. People tend to kind of pass them off because they see them in the ditches, but y'all, these are not the ones that grow in the ditch, although those are great too when you get them cultivated and take care of them. Um, but these are an amazing cash crop and a great for bouquet loving. So I wanna tell you that next week, we're talking about preparing for cool flowers, what things you can do to maybe get another zone south of you or north of you, um, and so that you can actually um, help your cool flowers to not just survive, but to help them thrive and to get them to bloom and to protect the foliage and um, just to get the best life out of your cool flowers. So y'all, please, um, I thank you so much for joining me here. And I just want you to really take away one thing from this. The greatest fail for cool flowers is if you do not plant them at all. You gotta plant them. Please share this and invite your friends for next week. You can always go to my blog and watch the previous weeks. Um, and until we meet again, friend, ciao.